Hi, my name is Jessica and one year ago I was diagnosed with ocular melanoma and for my one year cancerversary I decided I wanted to do something a little different and do a video blog about my journey this past year. So first of all, let me go back to how this all began. Uh, my journey with ocular melanoma began about 12 years ago when um, around 2007 an optometrist told me that I had a freckle in my eye and it was nothing to worry about because they were very common and I didn't really have any vision issues and so I did not see another optometrist for another five years. So in 2012, I saw another optometrist and obviously the freckle had grown a bit because he immediately referred me on to a retinal specialist. And I went to that retinal specialist who then immediately referred me on to an ocular oncologist. So I began my journey of trips down to Tucson, Arizona, where I would meet with Dr. Javid and he was monitoring and observing my uh, choroidal nevus. He would take measurements and evaluate the nevus for uh, various risk factors. I visited him for about three years and in 2015 he had told me that my nevus was starting to show some changes and it was showing some growth and he wasn't quite ready to recommend any kind of treatment and change my di diagnosis to melanoma but he was kind of moving me into the gray area. So. I went and sought a second opinion, and that is when I became established with Dr. Curley in Scottsdale, Arizona. I was really glad that I went and saw her because she put my mind at ease a little bit, and she decided to monitor my nevus for a little bit longer and take some of her own measurements since she had different equipment than Dr. Javid in Tucson. So she ended up monitoring me for almost three years. and. Each visit, I started out going every three months, then every six months, and then I was able to go once a year. And my nevus wasn't showing any significant changes. So January 30th, 2019, I uh, went to see Dr. Curley with my mom. I went into the appointment thinking it was gonna be like any other appointment. I, every time I went, Dr. Curley said it looks great, no changes, see you in another year. She did a few extra tests and took a little extra time with my eye and she just looked at me and said, have I ever told you I don't like your, your spot? And I was like, yeah, you've told me that. And then she said, have I told you that I really don't like your spot? And pretty much at that point, she told me that she was changing my diagnosis from a benign choroidal nevus to malignant melanoma. And then, Kind of the world stopped turning for a moment everything kind of just went black for me and um, i remember my ears getting really hot my hands starting to sweat and i actually went into the appointment pretty informed because i had been doing my own research over the years so i kind of knew where this could potentially lead so i sat in the room with dr curly and she walked through the um the procedures that I would probably be going through and what my next steps were gonna look like. And I, I actually had to stop her and I asked her if it would be okay if I went in out to the lobby and got my mom. And my mom came in and uh, she had never been to the office before and was a little surprised I was calling her back. Um, but I was really grateful she was there with me in that moment because I needed somebody else to listen to what the doctor was saying because everything, it felt like everything was just going in one ear and out the other and I wasn't really processing and absorbing um, all of the information. So Dr. Curley spent time talking about um, my procedure and she said that I would need to have radiation surgery within the next three to four weeks after diagnosis and that I needed to leave her office soon because I needed to go to another doctor to have more pictures taken and they were getting ready to close. And so um, at that point I was able to get Rick to join me. He was able to come and meet me and take, take over from there. Pretty much uh, when we got home that night we were just emotionally drained. Probably, I don't even know if I cried because I was pretty numb from from the news. Um, thankfully, my girls had an event that night and Rick and I had some time alone to talk through everything. But I knew that when I woke up the next morning, it was full steam ahead and it was appointments and tests and 
navigating work and um, telling people and everything was just gonna start from there. So, so that was a pretty, pretty big day for me. Um, pretty much that, that night I had to decide that I needed to be strong in that moment because things would get better. And while it may feel kind of stormy at that moment, um, it really can't rain forever, and I knew that I would, I would get through it. But I won't lie, the first three months were crazy and tiring, exhausting, a lot of anxiety, a lot of anxiousness, a lot of unknowns, and um, the first three months were tough. But Good now. At this point, we're at February of 2019, and we're at the point where I needed to tell friends and family, I needed to tell my coworkers and my boss, and uh, it, we went from 20 miles an hour to 90 miles an hour in how things were moving. Honestly, telling, telling my girls was probably the hardest because they knew I had a freckle in my eye. They knew it had been monitored for years. They had even come to, to Tucson with me to some of the appointments, but it took me a little bit of time before I told them the whole story and I used the word cancer and explained to them what ocular melanoma really was. And I needed to build up the courage, but I also needed to just take time to reflect and make sure that they were emotionally ready to hear all of that. Work was a little bit of a challenge, um, trying to focus on what I needed to do for my job responsibilities, but also I was making appointments and figuring out my leave of absence and planning for my extended absence. And I was gonna be off for about four, four to five weeks. My coworkers were amazing and I and my friends uh, out of state and here I got uh, showered with uh, pre-operative gifts and well wishes and um, the most amazing amount of support that I, I really needed that going in. I, within a week of my diagnosis, I went and had a full PET CT scan and that was to determine whether or not I had any uh, cancer anywhere else in my body and uh, by the grace of God, I did not. So um, it felt really good knowing that I was going into the surgery um, clean. Unfortunately, right after I had that CT scan, um, life got a little bit more stressful. My dad went into the hospital and he was in the hospital for a little over uh, a week before um, uh, things took a turn for the worse with his health. And during that time when he was in the hospital, I was also going to doctor's appointments and I had um, a really big appointment with Dr. Magus, who was my radiation doctor. And he met with Rick and I, and he walked us through the, the surgery and the procedure, and he explained how the tumor in my eye would be treated. So he showed us a sample plaque. Um, a plaque is a little gold disc, uh, and it has spaces for little radioactive seeds. And the disc is actually designed um, for your specific tumor. So he took a lot of measurements too, and all of that gets sent to a physicist who designed my plaque specifically for my eye. And um, the measurements also determine how much radiation they needed to administer. So that plaque is then sewn onto the eyeball and it remains in place for seven days. And during that seven days, the radiation is being targeted just at the tumor. Uh, my tumor is in the back of my eye, in the back of the retina. So it's not like you can see the freckle in, in my eye. He talked about how once when the plaque is in my eye that I would need to be isolated because I would be radioactive essentially. And so I couldn't, I would need to be away from my family and my pets and uh, spend that time alone until I had the second surgery to remove the radiation from my eye. Right after that appointment, my, um, my dad was moved to hospice care and uh, things kind of moved pretty quickly and he ended up passing on February 21st of 2019, which was seven days before my surgery. You know, we got through that time and I, I got as much accomplished with my siblings as I could prior to having the surgery. So, 
I went into surgery on February 28th, 2019. Rick drove me to my appointment and, you know, standard standard procedure, you know, hospital procedure of getting all prepped and, and being in the preoperative room. Um, it's kind of funny because they put a big X over the eye that you're having done so that they operated on the correct eye. And um, when they operated on my eye, they ended up cutting some of my, my eye muscles. Um, and they were able to rotate the eyeball to be able to sew the plaque on. And then while Dr. Curley and Dr. Magus were in my eye, they actually took a biopsy. And the purpose of getting a biopsy is so that you can determine the class of your tumor, and uh, which essentially uh, determines your risk for metastatic disease. My tumor's fairly small. It, it was about 2.2 millimeters thick. Um, the diameter was anywhere between 11 and 12 um, millimeters. Mine is cut early when it was small, and had I not been going for regular checkups and just went about my life, there is a chance that I may not have known about this for a long time, and the tumor would have been much larger, and I would have been at a much higher risk for um, future issues um, or the cancer spreading. So coming out of surgery was pretty typical and Rick took me home. I was able to be near him in the car for that short amount of time, but I needed to wear this um, super heavy lead patch over my eye and that helped block some of the radiation from um, you know, him getting exposed. So as soon as I came home, I pretty much set up shop in my bedroom and that became my home uh, for seven days. And my bedroom is large enough that people could come into the bedroom here and there and, and sit in some chairs kind of far away from the bed uh, to visit with me. So during my recovery, my seven days of the uh, uh, radiation being in, I spent a lot of time in bed. Um, I wasn't really able to read. I listened to books on tape. I was in pain, but not a significant amount of pain. It was just really red and irritating. The first 24 hours were the hardest. I had a little anxiety um, because I had a patch taped to my face and um, I, could, I couldn't do it. I ended up peeling it off and within like the first 12 hours, I could not sleep with it taped to my face. Um, and then I had to start administering drops, um, four different types of drops, like four times a day. It was uh, quite the regimen, but uh, the eye was red. It wasn't crazy, um, but I, um, I was uncomfortable but not unbearable. And each day that went by, I got a little bit more comfortable and I got a little bit more mobile. And so when the kids were at school and Rick was at work, I would get up and move about the house. I sat out in the backyard one time. Um, I was able to fend for myself when they were away from the house. And then when they were home, they would usually bring me food or go pick up fast food and bring it. I, I got a little crafty and I constructed my lead patch to be a little bit more comfortable and added some fleece and uh, the girls decorated my eye patch for me when they blinged it all out and um, made me you know, enjoy wearing it a little bit more um, because it was really heavy and really uncomfortable. So whenever anybody wasn't around, I took the lead patch off and um, you know, sometimes I would even patch my eye with like a, a, just a normal eye patch just so that it was easier for me to watch TV from a, a distance. My second surgery was on March 7th and um, basically went the exact same as the first surgery, all the preoperative um, preparations. And I was in surgery for maybe an hour and uh, came out and it was probably the most relieving to know that I didn't have the big lead eye patch. Um, I think probably the best moment out of this entire surgical journey was when I got home um, from surgery on March 7th. The girls were at school when I had it done, but when they came home and they got um, off the bus and came into the house, I was able to hug Rick and hug my kids and I squeezed them tight. I probably cried. Um, seven days is a really long time to not be able to hug your kids when they are in the same house as you. Um, that was a, 
a pretty awesome moment. Now we're into March and um, I'm into my first full month um, post-surgery and into major recovery mode. So March probably was my hardest month um, post-surgery. I just felt really uh, lonely at times and frustrated at times because I just wasn't myself and my vision was horrible and felt like I was going to be like this forever and it made me it made me really sad to think that I may never be able to see exactly the same way again. I just kept busy planning my dad's memorial and getting ready to travel for that because he's buried in Minneapolis. In mid-March, we traveled to Minneapolis uh, for his ceremony, and while my vision was very poor, um, I, I felt good. Uh, I did have a stitch that was sticking straight out of my eyeball. It was clear, so you couldn't really see it, but it was super irritating, and so that made it a little uncomfortable on the trip, and I had the most difficult time walking through the airport, um, and I had to kind of hold on to my husband or my girls um, because just the, the fast movement of people walking past me and my double vision um, and the poor vision uh, made it really difficult to, to walk through the airport. When we were in Minneapolis, I found out, my doctor called me, and I found out that I did not get any results from my biopsy. Not enough tissue sample came out, and so the results were inconclusive. So unfortunately, I don't have any of those results. And at first, I was initially really disappointed with not knowing my results. I, I'm an info knowledge is power kind of person, and it really I really struggled with the fact that I did not know um, anything about my tumor. Probably the hardest part of March was uh, learning to navigate the vision issues. I didn't drive until the end of March, and I, I needed to get behind the wheel because I went back to work on March 25th. Uh, I had really bad double vision, and um, it's really hard to describe what that's like, and so I would just try to vocalize to my family what, what having double vision feels like, but uh, everything I looked at was triple or quadruple. I wore different eye patches all of March and all of April. I started out by wearing a big eye patch over my eye um, when I was driving. Driving with one eye was really uncomfortable and, and the blind spots that are created by that. I also wore these little patches that slide over your glasses and then I started to get really creative and I started using washi tape um, to create little pieces and little circles that I covered my over my eyeglass so I didn't have to cover the whole lens. I could just cover a section of the lens that was just enough to cut my double vision um, enough that I, I felt like I could see better. Going to the grocery store was terrible. Um, just anytime I was walking, that was really hard. But going to the grocery store especially was really bad, trying to scan the shelves. So any kind of eye movement where I had to go left and right or up and down, uh, I couldn't see. It was like walking through a fun house all the time. And I would often grab on to my kids when I was walking because I was afraid I was gonna bump into something. I found at work what was really challenging was just talking to people. I, I work in the front office of a school. I talking all day long and um, especially if there were groups of people talking um, I didn't realize how much you move your eyes when you're in a group conversation and your eyes are constantly darting back and forth between different people and everything would just be a blur whenever I would do that and then the double vision each person there was two to four of them and so a small group felt like a really big group moving into April um, I, did a, I had to do a lot of driving at this point, and driving was super scary, especially uh, looking over my right shoulder. Um, even today, I'm a year out, um, I don't have good vision. I still have double vision when I look to the right, and so when I try to look over my shoulder, everything is blurry and double. Um, so I have to rely on my mirrors as much as possible and just my sense of intuition to make sure that it's safe on my right. Well, I started losing my eyelashes on my, my OMI. My sclera right here in the corner thickened. I don't know if you can see that. 
but it's still there. So it's red and it's like kind of built up and thick in that area. Um, I had really bad dry eye. I used drops every day, all day. I just kept little vials of drops in my back pocket and I used them all the time. I would get really sore right around here. Um, my bones would get sore. The, the biggest side effect I, or experience I had in April was just um, the emotions started to completely flood in. I had time to process my dad's passing, process the cancer, everything, and um, I just emotionally released. I cried a lot. My body, the toxins in my body were releasing. I felt ill. I just, I felt like the stress I was carrying for those two months just kind of flooded out of me. I couldn't go to church without crying my eyes out. And the medical bills started rolling in. And so that heightened the emotions and the stress a little bit um, because uh, an experience like this is, um, not cheap. So towards the end of April, the good news is I stopped patching my eye. Uh, my vision was distorted, but I worked through it and um, worked on training both of my eyes to focus and um, do the best that they could because um, I just needed to, to move on. So I had a couple of defining moments in April where I realized I could pull into the garage easier in my car or I could see things around the house just a little bit clearer. There was a moment that I came home from work and I just sat down at the kitchen table and I cried because I had looked around the house and realized that things that I couldn't see a week ago, I could now see. Um, so it was the encouragement that I needed that things are going to get better. Once I got past the first three months though, then my healing really began. In May, um, we celebrated with um, National Eye Patch Day and I used that as an opportunity to have a party. And I just wanted to celebrate the end of my surgery and a successful recovery. It was awesome because in that month, I had my three month follow up with my eye, um, eye doctor Dr. Curley and my tumor had shrunk it went from 2.2 millimeters to 1.4 it wasn't showing activity and so she essentially said the tumor was dead and that was amazing news and so what better way to celebrate than with a party so um, National Eye Patch Day is a thing and I used it to help raise some money for um, different ocular melanoma um, nonprofit foundations and I invited family and friends to come over and have a little fun. Um, we had a contest, an eye patch contest. People could wear you know, an, a regular eye patch or they could decorate their own eye patch. Uh, it was fun seeing some of the creativity and some people, you know, it had, it led to some interesting conversations of what is it like to have one one eye or to not have all the vision that you're used to having. Moving into July, uh, that is when I had my first round of CT scans and I get them every six months for five years. They scan my chest and my abdomen, primarily looking at the lungs and the liver um, for metastatic disease. And in July, I had my first round and I, I won't lie, there was a little anxiety around that and uh, Dr. Curley's amazing because she called me within 24 hours to tell me my scans were clear and that there was no um, uh, spreading of the cancer. So that was exciting and we celebrated with going on vacation as a family with my sister and her family and uh, went to, to Mexico for a week and had lots of summer fun. So um, I just continued my recovery and each month my vision got a little bit better. I do wear glasses most of the time. My vision in my OMI is poor um, but my good eye compensates for it. I don't love how my eye looks, but if somebody didn't know what I was going through, maybe they wouldn't really even notice. Um, I notice, but it's okay, you know? I've kind of just embraced it, and when I wear my glasses, it covers my OMI a little bit, but, um, you know, I can see, and I don't have cancer, a tumor, an active tumor in my eye anymore, so it's worth it. Um, People in the ocular melanoma community are called, affectionately called Omis, and um, 
I have a group of OMI friends in, in Phoenix that get together uh, monthly and we, we hang out and we go have a meal together and we talk and uh, we share our experiences and we're all at different stages in our journey so we can help each other, we can lift each other up, we encourage each other. It's like our own little support group because we understand what everybody has been through. To my marvelous OM mamas, I can't wait to get together with you guys again because um, I cherish you. And just want to give a shout out to the man, my husband Rick. Um, he has been uh, my shoulder to cry on. He's been my rock. He's been my source of encouragement. He's been um, everything. Okay, so moving forward, now that I've hit my one year cancer anniversary, uh, basically I'm just going about life. I'm doing my thing. I'm exploring my hobbies. I'm enjoying my family. I'm enjoying my work. I love blogging. Um, I'm doing the things that I love and a little vision issue isn't gonna stop me. I just had my second round of CT scans uh, this past weekend and again, I got good news and uh, in the cancer world, they call it NED, which means no evidence of disease and, and there's like a little saying that we're dancing with NED and so um, I am dancing with NED and I don't have any cancer anywhere else in my body. So I will continue to go to my ocular oncologist every three months. I will continue to get my scans every six months for the first five years. And I will make sure I will stay on top of my tumor and make sure that it never grows back. Um, and I will make sure that I am my best self. Okay, so the last thing I wanna say is that um, the best way to uh, detect ocular melanoma is to get your eyes dilated. Every year, go get checked out. Uh, the sooner something is found, the easier it is to treat and the lower your risk of having any future issues. And once ocular melanoma metastasizes, there is no cure. So please, please, please go get your eyes dilated. If you feel compelled, there are a number of ocular melanoma foundations. Uh, I would love if you would take a moment to consider making a donation to one of them. Um, there is no cure for this disease yet. Uh, we're close, things are coming out every day. Um, medical science is amazing and they're doing great work in this field, but um, we need more. Uh, thank you and I hope you enjoyed my story and I hope that um, it inspires some of you to go get your eyes dilated.